Uh, we had a, a briefing, so please bear with me. Uh, I think, as you know, uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, General Milley, uh, hosted today uh, his counterpart in the Israeli Defense Forces, the uh, Chief, Israeli General, uh, Chief of the Israeli General Staff, Lieutenant General Aviv Kohavi, uh, today at the Pentagon. The two leaders discussed several issues of mutual concern, including the current security environment throughout the Middle East. General Milley reaffirmed, of course, the U.S. commitment to its relationship with Israel. Uh, Secretary Austin uh, did uh, attend part of the meeting uh, as well, popped in for, for part of it. Uh, and as you know, the U.S. and Israel enjoy a strong military-to-military -military relationship as key partners committed to peace and security in the region. Um, on the department's support to the federal response against COVID, I, I can uh, announce that the last federally supported community vaccination center, which was located in New Jersey, conducted its final day of operations yesterday. More than 5,100 active duty service members supported 48 federal sites across the country, including Guam, Northern Marianas, and the Virgin Islands, uh, and provided nearly 5 million COVID vaccines. The National Guard continues their support to state and local communities, and to date they have helped administer over 12 million vaccines to the American public. So combined, that's over 17 million vaccines uh, by service members. Uh, as we often see in times of crisis, uh, our troops uh, are marshaled to care for their fellow Americans, and the Secretary uh, is very, very proud of the critical role that they played uh, throughout this pandemic and thanks them and their families for the sacrifices and the service that they've rendered their fellow citizens. Um, we have three exercises to highlight today. In Southern Command's area of responsibility, representatives from the United States and 18 partner nations are participating in the 36th annual Trade Winds exercise in Guyana. Trade Winds 21 is a Caribbean-focused security exercise that's uh, designed to exchange knowledge and expertise to maintain regional security and prosperity throughout the Caribbean and the Caribbean Basin. The exercise kicked off actually on the 13th, and it will run through the 25th of this month. Friday also marked the conclusion of two exercises. Exercise African Lion 2021 wrapped up. That's uh, Africa Command's largest joint annual exercise. More than 7,000 participants from nine nations and, uh, and, from, uh, and from NATO trained together in Morocco, Tunisia, and Senegal with a focus on enhancing readiness across air, land, sea, and cyber domains. And we want to congratulate them for the completion of that. Friday also marked the conclusion of the 50th iteration of the premier maritime-focused defensive exercise called BALTOPS. For the first time, our Navy and Marine Corps used unmanned aircraft systems to detect and map mines, a capability that frankly benefits all mariners, regardless of the flag flown. Uh, this exercise included more than 40 ships, 60 aircraft, and more than 4,000 military members from 18 different nations. Uh, moving on, to, uh, staying on the Navy theme there, on Friday, the 18th of June, the USS Gerald R. Ford successfully completed the first scheduled explosive event as part of its full ship shock trials. I think you probably have seen some of the video and the imagery out of that. This, uh, the first in-class aircraft carrier was designed using advanced computer modeling methods, testing, and analysis to ensure that the ship is hardened to withstand battle conditions, and these shock trials provide data that will be used in validating the shock hardness of the ship. Uh, the Navy is conducting the shock trial testing in accordance with uh, uh, OPNAV instruction uh, 9072.2 and as mandated by the National Defense Authorization Act of 2016. Uh, let's see. Um, on to uh, uh, COVID uh, conditions here at the Pentagon. The Pentagon Reservation will reduce its health protection condition from Bravo Plus where we have been since November of 2020 to HBCon Bravo. And that's effective at 5 a.m. on this Wednesday, the 23rd of June. Under HBCon Bravo, the occupancy goal will be no more than 50% in workspaces. It's up, that's up from 40% right now, where we are now. Supervisors will continue to provide maximum telework opportunities to eligible employees. Personnel who are not fully vaccinated should continue to follow DOD mask and social distancing guidelines. You see the signs all over the Pentagon that talk about that. Random COVID-19 entrance screening of the workforce will continue at about 10 to 20 percent levels, and COVID-19 screening for visitors will continue at 100 percent. The Pentagon reservation remains closed for public tours, and the Pentagon 9-11 memorial remains closed. 
Gatherings on the Pentagon Reservation are limited to fewer than 50 people, currently fewer than 25, so that'll go up a little bit. For here in the briefing room, that means that uh, we won't be totally back to normal, but uh, we, starting Wednesday, there'll be some more seating here uh, for in-person attendance at the press briefings. And with that, I'm done. Bob. <laughs> Thank you. Um, question about Afghanistan. Um, the Taliban apparently have made some significant gains in recent weeks and even as recently as past weekend, uh, maybe especially in the north. Is Secretary Austin considering recommending either a slowdown in the withdrawal or some other changes that would perhaps be designed to minimize the chance of an early collapse of the Afghan forces? Uh, I would say, without speaking specifically to um, um, the, the the Taliban advances you, you spoke to, the, uh, as the secretary has uh, said, the the withdrawal uh, is on pace. It is a dynamic situation, and we've said that from the very beginning. Which means that uh, he and uh, uh, the chairman, General McKenzie, are constantly looking at. Um, uh, the pace we're going at and the capabilities we have and the capabilities that we're going to need throughout to complete the withdrawal. And so, as we said from the very beginning, um, uh, while there is a schedule, we were mindful that that schedule could fluctuate and change as, as conditions change, too. So um, I, I, I can't speak to any specific recommendations he's making uh, about the Taliban advances, but I can tell you that, that he's looking at the situation every day with a fresh set of eyes to see if, you know, the, the pace that we're setting is the appropriate pace for the kinds of capabilities that uh, we think we need to, again, conduct a safe and orderly retrograde. So as he looks, as he looks at it now, today, does he see something different than he saw a few weeks ago? In other words, that make him think something different has to be done? Every day, it's, it, you know, uh, the situation in Afghanistan changes as uh, the Taliban continue to, um, to uh, conduct these attacks um, uh, and to, to raid district centers, as well as the violence, which is still too high. I mean, every day, there's a, a fresh set of data to look at that, that helps inform um, uh, his discussions with military commanders and, and eventually whatever changes might come of that. One last thing then on that. Has he received recommendations from either General McKenzie or General Miller to change the approach? I'm not going to speak to the specific discussions that he's having with his operational commanders about the situation on the ground. But again, Bob, and I understand where the question's coming from. I mean, it is a dynamic situation. And we said from the outset that we're going to treat it as such, uh, and that, uh, that if there need to be changes made uh, to the pace, uh, or to the scope and scale of uh, the retrograde on any given day or in any given week, and we want to maintain the flexibility to do that. What's really critical here is that nothing has changed about two things. One, we will complete uh, uh, the withdrawal of all U.S. forces out of Afghanistan, with the exception of those that will be left to protect the diplomatic presence, and two, that it will be done uh, before early September as per uh, the Commander-in-Chief's orders. Those two things are constant and won't change. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Let me go to the phone. Stephen Losey. Right, thanks, John. Uh, I would like to ask about the uh, DOD's withdrawal of some assets, including uh, some, anti some air defense anti-missile um, assets. Can you talk a little bit more about what makes the Pentagon uh, confident that now is the right time to safely withdraw some of these anti-missile assets as well as some of the, uh, reportedly, some of the fighter squadrons? Well, look, I'm, I think you're talking about a uh, Wall Street Journal report. I'm not going to speak to the details of, uh, of that press reporting. I, I would just say this, uh, uh, Stephen, and that's, and, and you know this, uh, that, uh, A, we have a very robust presence uh, in the Middle East region, a lot of capabilities there. Uh, uh, tens of thousands of uh, uh, personnel, um, as well as systems and capabilities across the region at various uh, facilities and bases. And the Secretary believes that it's important that that presence and those capabilities remain robust. Number two, that um, 
and it's not uncommon uh, in that or any other uh, area of responsibility around the world, uh, we have to constantly take a look at the at, at the uh, sustainment capability for those capabilities. I'm sorry, that's, that's not worded well. Let me take that again. We have to look at the ability to sustain those capabilities and systems in whatever region they're deployed. Um, and it is not uncommon for us to move resources around, sometimes within a theater, sometimes outside a theater and into other theaters based on whatever the threats, challenges, uh, and risks that, we, uh, that, we're, uh, that we're facing, as well as the need uh, to maintain some of these systems. Uh, uh, some, some of the places where these capabilities exist, it's a pretty harsh environment. Uh, and uh, some of these systems and capabilities have been in these environments for a long time. Um, and we need to be able to, to, to get them home, get them fixed, get them maintained uh, so that they can be redeployed appropriately. So it's, again, it's a dynamic situation. We're constantly making these sorts of uh, decisions. And the Secretary takes seriously his responsibility to make sure that certainly in uh, the, an area like the Middle East that we can maintain and sustain sustain the kinds of capabilities uh, to back up our force presence and to, uh, um, and to properly look after our security commitments to ourselves uh, and to our partners. And he's confident um, that we're doing exactly that. I mean, it's not just the Wall Street Journal report. The OSDPA this morning confirmed that there were some assets, including primarily air defense assets, that were with withdrawn. So what I'm wondering is, like, is you know, is the Pentagon confident that like these assets will not be needed to deter or um, parry any um, uh, any any potential action from a nation such as Iran in the region. Uh, the, the secretary would, would does not and would not make decisions about redeploying assets or, or capabilities if he didn't believe that in in so doing wherever these are and wherever they're going uh, would put our our security commitments at uh, at unnecessary uh, and greater risk. Abraham. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, is the Secretary any closer to understanding the definition of over the horizon than on April 16th? And then uh, I have a follow-up question. I'm not sure I understand over the, horizon, the question. Uh, there's never been a confusion about the definition of what over the horizon means. I'm not sure what you mean. What I mean is, uh, are there base agreements uh, in negotiation, planning, is there anything more that can be said as to how the United States is going to be able to provide over-the-horizon support than was known back in April when it was first brought up as a possibility? There's still active discussions going on inside the department and uh, uh, and actually at the State Department to, um, uh, to, to look at uh, how we will actualize over-the-horizon counterterrorism capabilities. Um, certainly, the secretary supports a diplomatic, the diplomatic effort that's ongoing right now to see if there are basing solutions that could happen uh, uh, in and around the region. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, uh, of any assurances that we've received to date, but I know that the State Department's hard at work on that. He's also tasked General McKenzie to look at uh, w what sorts of other over the horizon capabilities we have existing in the region and how can we best exploit those. The other thing I'd say, and I said this last week, is that uh, we tend to forget that we already do have over-the-horizon capability when it comes to the counterterrorism threat in Afghanistan. Is it robust enough? Is it is it sustainable enough over the long term? Well, that's what we're looking at. Uh, but uh, you know that the Secretary uh, extended the USS Eisenhower in the region. Uh, we've deployed uh, a bomber task force uh, to the region. Um, uh, and there are other um, facilities, bases, uh, again, in the, in the Middle East uh, that can be of some service. So nobody's discounting how difficult this is. Uh, but as the Secretary said, difficult does not mean impossible, and that we have the ability right now to reach any scrap of earth that we believe we need to, uh, should the you know should the risk warrant it. So no further progress has been made then. Since I then. don't have anything more more to announce, but I do think it's important to remember, uh, it's not like we're starting from zero. We have a capability over the horizon uh, right now, as you and I speak. And then the DoD planning for the support for the uh, special immigrant visa applicants. Is there anything more on that? I don't have anything uh, additional to add from what we've said before. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. uh, Sangman Lee, Radio Free Asia. Oh, yeah. Um, so the Mr. Eli Latner, nominated to be Assistant Secretary of Indo-Pacific Security, a witness in Senate hearing last week in his written statement that 
If we confirm, he will review the current status of U.S. Uh, bilateral and multilateral exercise to maintain uh, readiness of forces in and around the Korean Peninsula. So is it likely to consider the resumption of a large scale U.S. South Korea joint military exercise in the near future like August based on his remark? Um, I, I did not get all of that question. Would you mind repeating it? I apologize. Okay. The Mr. Eli Latner, the nominee to be assistant of Secretary of Indo-Pacific Security, uh, he witnessed in Senate hearing last week, and he said in his written statement that if we confirm, he will review the current status of U.S. bilateral and multilateral exercise to maintain the readiness of forces in Korean Peninsula. So based on his remark, I want to know, is he likely to consider the resumption of a large scale U.S. South Korea joint military exercise in the near future, like this August? Well, thanks for repeating it. Um, I don't have anything to announce today with respect to changes in uh, uh, training on the Korean Peninsula. As I've said before, this is something that we uh, constantly review and assess um, given the uh, uh, strategic environment um, uh, and uh, obviously should Dr. Ratner uh, get confirmed, I, I'm, I'm sure he'll um, meet, uh, meet his promise of, of taking a look at uh, training and exercises there, but I don't have anything um, additional to say today or any changes to the, to the program, except to say what we said, oh, as we always say, that, that, that we know we have to, our forces have got to be ready to fight tonight, and uh, we, we're constantly looking at the, the training events there to make sure that they're appropriate and they're properly scaled um, to the threats and the challenges. So, um, can we go back to Afghanistan? Um, could you speak about the contractors? There are some uh, reports uh, about the possibility of um, keeping some contractors there, but they would be paid by the Afghan government instead of the U.S. government. Is it something that is uh, um, discussed? I, I think there's a range of options that we're looking at for how to continue to provide contractual support for the Afghan uh, forces, specifically the Afghan Air Forces. We've come to know f final conclusions about what that's going to look like. We're very actively uh, working our way through that right now. So you, you, you are confirming it is... The We're looking at a range of options. Uh, I'm not at liberty to confirm any specific one uh, right now. But again, our, our support for the Afghan forces, once the retrograde is complete, will be largely financial, uh, and it will be... Uh, uh, in terms of contractual support designed to help them uh, logistically and in a maintenance perspective with respect to their air forces. But it'll be, uh, but it'll be uh, uh, largely over the horizon as well, uh, contractual support. Uh, I, don't, I don't know of any specific uh, uh, other options that are being considered, but again, uh, I think uh, we haven't come to any final conclusions and we're, we're looking at a range of, of different alternatives. Okay. Yes, in the back. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to ask you about Taiwan. That last week, the General Mili said that before the Senate Appropriation Committee that there is a low probability that China would take over Taiwan militarily in the near future. But on the other hand, the commander of the Indo-Pacific Command, Admiral Aquilino, said in March that the incursion could be much closer than most people think. So it seems there is, uh, their statements are not consistent. Could you clarify uh, the DOD's assessment on how urgent the Taiwan Strait contingency, contingency would be? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I don't think, uh, I, I, I put it this way, I think everybody is uh, mindful of, uh, of tensions in that part of the world, and just as importantly, Everybody here in the department is mindful of our obligations to help Taiwan be able to defend itself in accordance with the Taiwan Relations Act, the three communiques, the six assurances. Nothing's changed uh, about U.S. policy with respect to, to Taiwan, and I think everybody's uh, properly uh, focused on making sure that we're meeting our obligations. Um, and, I, and I certainly wouldn't, uh, from the podium, speak to intelligence assessments one way or the other uh, about Chinese intentions. Nobody wants to see uh, the status quo change unilaterally 
and certainly no one wants to see it changed by force. Uh, that's in no one's interest. Um, and again, U.S. policy has been consistent, uh, and I think it will remain so. Oh, just a quick follow-up. So, is it fair to say that there is still a wide variety of assessment on the urgency of the Taiwan Strait contingency? A wide what? Wide, uh, wide a variety of assessment. There are so many uh, assessments, different assessments on. No, urgency. actually, I don't think that's fair to say, and I'm certainly not going to talk about intelligence assessments here uh, from the podium. I, I think what you're hearing from leadership throughout the department. Uh, including from the secretary, is that we're all mindful of of growing tensions, and uh, and, and we're certainly, as I said before, uh, very mindful of our obligations. And everybody's focused on that, on how we can best meet our obligations. Nobody wants to see this uh, evolve into conflict. Nobody wants to see a unilateral change in the status quo. Thank you. Yep, you bet. Okay, uh, Mallory from USNI. Thanks, John. Um the Carlton Strike Group, Carrier Strike Group, is training uh, near Hawaii ahead of its upcoming deployment uh, instead of California. Is the intent to signal U.S. presence in the Indo-Pacific? I, I, uh, we we're constantly uh, altering the locations of where we train and uh, and how we train um, to uh, to best meet again our security commitments. I I, I, uh, I I would caution you from thinking that there's some sort of specific message here. Uh, other than, I mean, obviously we are focused on the Indo-Pacific, um, and uh, and you've heard the secretary talk about this quite a bit. Um, so it, it shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody that we would be uh, training and taking advantage of um, of training opportunities throughout the region. Is there any reason why it's off Hawaii as opposed to where it would normally be uh, off of California? I, mean, I would refer you to. Uh, uh, Pacific Fleet for specifics about how they choose locations, but um, but again, uh, uh, whether it's off California or it's off Hawaii, it's still in the Indo-Pacific, it's still in the Pacific Ocean, um, and it's still representative of our, of our commitment to uh, to broader regional security there. Yeah. Over the weekend, Secretary Austin and Defense Minister Akar had a phone call. Is there a deal on protecting uh, the Kabul airbase? Well, I think you heard. The National Security Advisor uh, on Sunday speak uh, to the, the meeting between uh, President Biden and uh, President Erdogan, where Turkey uh, agreed to take the lead role in, in terms of security at the airport. There are still details to be worked out. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, they have indicated that they uh, uh, we'll need some support from the United States and international community, and we're working our way through that. And that phone call over the weekend was in line with those discussions. And is the United States ready to provide financial or logistic support to this? Uh, again, we're still working our way through exactly what the support would look like. We don't have final answers on that right now. Thank yeah. you. Jenny. Thank you, John. Um, I'd like to ask about the North Korea using uh, EMP, you know, electromagnetic weapons. The U.S. Congressional Advisor Group and uh, military uh, expert recently reported that North Korea has completed uh, an EMP weapons, and uh, they want uh, of North Korea using an EMP uh, weapons to attack United States military facilities. What countermeasure do you have against this? Uh, I'm not going to get into th this topic here from the podium, Janie. Um, uh, we're certainly uh, mindful of this technology um, and, and the capability, uh, but I am not going to get into the habit of speaking to the specifics of it here from this podium or. Uh, or, or what countermeasures we may or may not uh, have in place or be pursuing. Uh, we take seriously our responsibilities to defend our interests and uh, our national security in that or any other part of the world, uh, and I can assure you that the department's focused on that. The Cyber Command uh, responsibilities this? No, I'm not going to go further on this issue. All right, this is very serious uh, damage mm -hmm. if uh, that happens. Thank you. You're welcome. David. Do you have any update on the sexual assault task force, isn't there a 90-day period? That's correct. Their 90-day period is up. Uh, they will be providing um, 
the, the rest of their recommendations to the secretary uh, this afternoon. He'll take some time to review those uh, recommendations and uh, uh, he'll want to make sure that he gets as he had before on line of, uh, line of effort one on accountability, uh, that he has uh, given the military departments and the chairman time to provide their feedback as well. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have two quick questions. First one, uh, can you please give us more details, if you can, of course, on uh, uh, General uh, Kohavi's uh, meetings here at the Pentagon and also the issues that sure. were discussed? And the other question, if there is like plan to, uh, uh, to uh, general, uh, I mean, Secretary Austin to be part of uh, the discussions or the meetings between the Afghani president and President Biden? So on your first question, as, as I stepped out here, the meeting was still ongoing. Uh, and I'm uh, given to understand that the Joint Staff uh, Public Affairs Office will be issuing a readout since it was a, a, a meeting hosted by uh, General Milley. It's more appropriate for them to speak to that, and I'll let them do that. And I'm sure that they'll do that this afternoon. Um, I don't have any um, scheduling uh, announcements to make with respect to the secretary and President Ghani's visit on on Friday, and you know if and when I do, we'll certainly let you know. Yeah, yeah Louis. Um, I'd like to go back to Bob's initial question about you know whether the secretary was recommending um, or discussing the pace of the withdrawal. Right. Um, does, does the mission to advise and assist Afghan forces in their fight against the Taliban s still exist? And is that something that the, that the secretary has to consider as he follows through with the other mission that the president has given? To as as we said before, Louis, uh, so long as we have the uh, capability in, in Afghanistan, we'll continue to provide uh, assistance um, to Afghan forces. But as the retrograde gets closer to completion, those capabilities will, will wane and uh, will no longer be available. Um, to be used in that way. As you and I speak, you know, we are still providing uh, a measure of, of support in that regard. But again, that will change over time. And um, uh, as, a withdrawal, as we complete the withdrawal, uh, the mission will be the mission assigned by the commander in chief, which is to uh, provide an over the horizon counterterrorism capability to prevent attacks on the homeland and to continue to support the Afghan forces, but from, again, a, fina a largely financial perspective. So, you know, in this building, there's this term that we hear a lot, an inflection point. Th does that mean that there will be an inflection point where the U.S. Uh, can no longer provide that mission? And when are we at that point right now, or are we close to it, which may be a reason why the secretary may be considering? Certainly there will come a, 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 a point where um, uh, those types of capabilities are simply no longer um, uh, available to uh, General Miller to be able to provide. I would defer to him uh, in terms of what that timing looks like. I'm, so, I'm in no position uh, to guesstimate uh, right now when that's going to happen. But c certainly there's going to be a, a time where we've reached that point. And again, I, I, it's really for him to decide in consultation, of course, with General McKenzie and, and the secretary. Um, and as I tried to explain it, maybe I didn't do it well enough with to Bob's question, but I mean we're constantly taking a look at this every single day. Uh, what's the situation on the ground? What capabilities do we have? What additional resources do we need to move out of Afghanistan, and at, w at what pace? And all of these decisions are literally being made in, in real time. The last one on this. Sure. So, so does that mean that um, General Miller and then therefore Secretary Austin have to look at the the whole approach in Afghanistan in terms of? You're looking at it daily, you know, looking at sure. the situation. Does that mean that, okay, we have to look at this and determine uh, how will this affect the pacing and how will it affect the stability of the government uh, uh, of inside Afghanistan after the U.S. departs? I, I think the best way I can answer the question, unsatisfying though it may be, is that we take a, a, into account a whole range of factors as we continue to move through the retrograde. But again, Louis, two things are not changing. We will get. We will be out of Afghanistan, uh, with the exception of whatever presence is required to protect our diplomatic mission there, and that's still being worked. And we will be out of Afghanistan 
by early September. Those two things are not changing. Okay. Um, Anson? Hi, thank you. Um, I had one quick question on what was brought up last week by General Milley. Um, in a hearing, he talked about improving the mill-to-mill -mill relationship with China and specifically citing the need for clearer communication with counterparts um, in China. Um, what, the, what Has there been any developments to enhance these relations or improve the communication between the U.S. military and the PLA? I don't know of any changes uh, necessarily to the mill-to-mill -mill communications and relations. Um, I think it goes without saying that uh, uh, that the relationship with China is uh, is tense right now, um, um, and uh, uh, and I think General Milley, what he was trying to express, and I think he's right, is that you know the more that the more that there can be um, a, a sense of dialogue. Uh, that is trustworthy. Um, the less chances there there are going to be for miscalculations that could uh, that could lead to, to worse outcomes. So clearly, we obviously uh, don't want to see that miscalculation. But I mean, uh, I don't know. I don't, there's no. Uh, I don't have any changes to speak to with respect to um, the bilateral relationship with the PLA right now. Okay, looks like that's it. Thank you.